Hello, good afternoon. Uh, we've heard some interesting answers to questions like how will AI impact the future of work? How will it impact the future of our lives? But obviously the most important question is how will AI affect football? So, um, hands up who has read the book called Moneyball? There you go, less than we thought. So, Moneyball is about a gentleman called Billy Bean. Billy Bean, uh, he's a general manager of a baseball club. He helped a small baseball club start beating huge baseball clubs because he applied analytics to certain baseball players that were being overlooked by the big clubs. Now, applying this um, analysis of data doesn't yet happen in football, but Heels here is helping that happen. Um, so Heels, let's talk about what you've been up to. How, uh, why did you choose football to get your, apply your data expertise? H how did Sci Sports start? Well, basically, when you live in the Netherlands, football is where you grow up with. Um, so I love to play myself, but I noticed at a really early age that my feet weren't as fast as my brains. Um, so I thought, well, if I can't be a professional football player, um, why can't we do something in that field? And when I went to uni, I um, played a lot of football manager, which is a game where you can crawl into the head of the football manager and identify players from all over the world. And then we thought, okay, if we can do this in a game, why can't we do this in real life? And that's why we started the company. There you go. And you're, uh, we can add you to the list of um, successful founders that dropped out of university. Um, so what, what was that like? Was that a big gamble? Yeah, well, my mom wasn't really proud when I announced that I was going to quit. Um, but I thought, well, if you're going to do this full time, um, I finished my bachelor's. Um, but then, yeah, when you are in uni and you need to focus, when you want to grow your company, you really want to follow your dream, make an impact in the football industry, uh, there was only one way, and that was uh, to get out of college. We stayed at the university with our office, uh, but still uh, no college rooms for me anymore. Good stuff. Now, let's look at what um, Side Sports actually does. Now, we've got some profiles of some players that we bring up. Um, so the Size Skill Index, this is the um, what Size Sports is famous for. So got two profiles here of some famous, famous players. Now, your business it analyzes 90,000 players worldwide and provides a balance for all clubs to compare different kinds of players. Um, so t tell us more about that. How, how does that work? Uh, what we basically do is to try to quantify the quality and the potential of every player around the world. Um, how the data is generated nowadays is that humans click every pass during each match. They do it manually, and that's how the data is collected. What we wanted to do is to be able to identify the upcoming players in Chile and compare them with the top players. So what we did is that we used just basic information to quantify what the impact is of every player on a team um, in a defensive and offensive way. Um, so we predict the outcome of the match, and if we say, well, Liverpool's playing against Chelsea, we expect Liverpool to win with 3-1. to one. In the end, it becomes 3-3. Three to three. Then the attack of Liverpool performed as expected, but the defense underperformed. So you can redistribute the qualities of these players. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got, um, you can bring up the slide that has your uh, countryman, Matthijs de Ligt. So obviously, we're at an AI conference, and one of the things uh, Heels uses is machine learning to predict the future potential of players. Now, Matthijs de Ligt on the right, he's a very young player. Um, so at the moment, on the size skill index, he's 87.5. But he always uses machine learning to predict uh, Matthijs' potential. So how, how do you use machine learning? How does that come in? Uh, basically, what we do is we look for similar players who have a similar growth, similar um, development, and also a similar position. So if you know what the players did in the past, so you can compare Matthijs de Ligt, for instance, with um, David Louis. Um, or with John Terry, and you can see the quality of the players and how they develop. And then the algorithm itself looks for similar players and how they are growing and say, well, we expect you to be um, as good as 158.7 when you're at your peak age, which is for center defender 28.5. Mm. So we've actually got a, a diagram of the algorithm that you can uh, hopefully make sense to us. So th this is basically what you're talking about. So this is, this is the guts of your machine learning Algorithms. How, how explain again, like you just did, maybe go into a bit more detail. How, how, how does this work? Uh, yeah, basically, we uh, reward a uh, percentage of uh, contribution for every position. So, if you are a defender, you're 90% responsible for defending and 10% for attacking. 
Um, and then if the match get played, we predict the matches. Um, a funny thing is that we could predict the matches better than the bookmakers, uh, because we made an ROI of 9.4% by outperforming their um, predictability of the matches. Um, and then you can see, well, the player overperformed, so we redistribute the qualities of every player based on who is playing. And therefore, you don't take a look at if they are passing well, if they are shooting well, but if they are contributing to the quality of the team. And that's what you can see in the long run. So you can actually quantify how the players are actually um, of importance to the team. So if you, the team is always playing well um, when you're on the team and playing bad when you're not on the team, it looks for these, these patterns and see, well, the team is really becoming better if you're playing. OK, good stuff. Now, here was an I had a uh, bit of fun putting this bit together. So one of the things, um, unfortunately, to, to managers, we're all managers in, in the room, uh, humans are unpredictable. Sadly, um, so obviously footballers, some are different than others. So we've got a little, a little story we've put together, uh, the tale of the two Marios. So there's two different, two different football players, Mario Goetze and Mario Balotelli. I hope we can get their slides up um, at the moment. Yep, so there they are, two Marios. So Mario Goetze on the right, for those of you who aren't familiar with football. Um, Mario Goetze, if he was a student, he would be a B-plus student who came to school, tried really hard and got a B-plus. Mario Balotelli, magnificent football player, um, he should be an A-grade student, but he loves misbehaving, and he therefore gets a D. Um, so obviously, the, the size skill index and machine learning can't bring in uh, human personalities. Uh, we can actually got a, uh, the next slide that actually shows, uh, shows their development over time, which gives, again, shows you more about what Heels' business does. I mean, what, what, what does this show, Heels, if we leave this slide on for a minute? What, what does this, these two graphs show? Uh, basically, what you see in orange is the quality of the, uh, of the player at that moment, and the dotted line is how we expected him, how good we expected him to be. So what you can see, for instance, with Balotelli, when he just came up, um, he was one of the most talented players in the world. Everybody loved him, um, he was doing really well. Um, and for Mario Götze, the same. But Mario Götze, uh, he scored the most important goal that a player could score in his career. He scored the goal-winning um, goal in the extended time of a World Cup final. Um, but after that, well, his body wasn't um, performing well. He got injured all the time. And Mario Balotelli, yeah, he's, uh, he's a crazy guy. I've also got, got a slide about Mario. So again, hope, if you're not familiar with football, uh, Mario Balotelli is a magnificent person just to follow. Um, I'm sure we've all, again, we're all managers in here. Hopefully there's, maybe there's someone in your team that is unmanageable. He has been described as unmanageable. So he's uh, received 12 red cards for six different teams. Um, 2010 and 2011, these are some highlights that Hills and I pulled up from his behavior. So when he was in Italy, he uh, got a bit bored and drove into a woman's prison just to have a look around. Uh, got questioned by the police. And in 2011, uh, he set his own house on fire because he let off a firework inside his house. So, that, I think, actually makes, makes football more fun, but your, your machine learning algorithm can't predict that yet, can it? No, he also went to the supermarket uh, to do some grocery shopping for his mom, and he came back with 10 go-karts. Um, <laughs> so those are the things. Well, that's also uh, one of my favorite movies it's called Gattaca. Uh, what they mentioned there is that there's no gene for the human spirit. And I think that's also crucially important for the game. You, cannot, you can identify what a player is doing on the pitch, uh, but what he's doing off the pitch is still really hard to quantify at this moment in time. Could that happen in the future? Yeah, well, actually, we developed one model that could identify how players cope with pressure. It's also working with machine learning, where we identify the pressure before the match and the pressure in the match, so you can see if the players are performing better or worse during, when they are playing. Um, and I think with that, you can see that some players, like Sergio Aguero, they perform better uh, Wills, there's a high-intensity match, and there's a lot at stake. Um, and some players are just ice cold, like Cristiano Ronaldo, and they always perform the same consistently. And that's e really valuable information to know if you're a coach. Yeah, good stuff. Now, we'll stay on um, AI and machine learning. So one of the uh, new features of Heels' is business is a concept called Ball James. So we've got, got a video uh, about that that we'll play in the background. So uh, Ball James uses deep learning to autonomously track football matches in 3D. So Obviously, we're at an AI conference. How, how does this work? How, how is this the next level of applying AI to your business? Uh, basically, what we are doing is we are installing 14 4K cameras 
around the pitch, where we add a GPU on the camera, and we um, can almost in real time transform the video footage into 3D data, which means that we are trans, um, transforming 24 terabytes of data in real time to 3D data. Um, that's where we use the, um, a lot of GPU clustering to actually identify what is the team of the player. And what you see in deep learning now is there's a lot of research done on identifying people and using um, the colors of the shirts. So if you're in the conference room, you can identify us by differentiating us from um, our clothing. But in football, that's a different problem. Um, we are all wearing the same jerseys. So you, you need an identifier to detect who's which player. Um, next to that, you have to be fast because the coach wants insights rather than raw data. Um, but we try to eliminate the entire process of manually annotating everything that you want to fully transforming it into a 3D model so you can actually measure shot power or moving agility or um, if a player shoots with the inside or the outside of his foot. And for that, we were able to, uh, yeah, to, it's fully based on deep learning to transform video footage into a 3D model. So who, who would use it? Uh, right now, the clubs use it mm -hmm. to identify uh, how they could perform better during the break. So if a player comes in and he's a lot faster than the player that you have on the team, you can substitute your player and the system suggests this could be a nice addition for your team right now. Mm -hmm. But in the end, the coach always decides. Is that cheating? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so how, um, what about, we mentioned about players using it, like you mentioned the, the story about um, Van Persie, who's a, who's a player, he, he, was, he understood some data that if he, if he ran to the far, a particular part of the box when there's a corner, he understood that he should go there. I mean, how, how, how could this, all this data, how could this revolutionize how players think on the, on the pitch as well? Yeah, it's really about the, uh, bringing them the right information. So don't overfill them with the, uh, with the information. What Van Persie, for instance, thought um, is that he knows that his um, best action with the corner was to run to the first post. Um, but if he does that all the time, people will recognize his patterns. So he chose only to do that during the right moments. And I think for this also, how to uh, create space, how to identify where the positions are that are in your favorite. Uh, maybe how are you performing against the fast wing back? And right now the, the players or the teams use it, um, the Belgium national team uses it to identify how can we outperform our competitors with uh, set pieces? Or where's the space during the, uh, uh, during the counter attacks? Well, see, to, uh, relating what, what we're talking about to, to wider businesses, obviously with, with AI and big data, there's going to be enormous amounts of data out there. Is, we talk about information bias. Uh, there's so much data out there. When do you sort of draw the line and say, OK, I'm going to make the decision based on the data? Is, is there um, a concern from the coaches or maybe, maybe you as a fan that the coaches are going to start relying on data too much and, th and they're not going to start using their own in intuition? Where's, where's the sort of balance with that? Yeah, great question. I think that's also the problem what happened to basketball. And the entire game changed because the clubs are, were using data too much. And they were only aiming for the three-pointers from a certain position or the rebound from a dunk. Um, but basketball is a static game. Um, there's a lot of goals being scored. Um, well, baseball, we saw Moneyball in the beginning. Um, if you try to use the models of baseball to football and transform the game into that, it's like taking corners the entire match. And football fans don't love that. It's so complex. You have 22 actors on the pitch who are uh, thinking all the time, and everyone is dependent on each other. So I think it will not change the game too much, but it will help you to get the percentages extra, mm. um, to make the game more fast, um, to create more chances, and it will really help you to enrich the game. And Do you think there's ever going to be a point where um, regulators, someone like FIFA or UEFA, steps in and says, AI can only be used for this and nothing more? Is, is there where, where, where could AI get to a point where people, fans as well, start thinking, oh, th this has changed the game too much, it's, it's cheating? Yeah. I think uh, the regulations are already pretty strict because you cannot have uh, technology on the pitch. Um, so at, at lo as long as you keep the technology off the pitch, AI will give you a certain uh, benefit, but only the coach can use it. And the coach can steer the game a little bit, um, but he will never be in the front seat um, performing the actions of the players.
Yeah, well, robot football, maybe. Um, let's wait and see. So, one of the other ma major parts of the Sci Sports business. So, we had the profiles um, up earlier. So, one of the main parts of the business is Heels helps football clubs around the world choose which players to buy. So, the transfer window actually shut uh, last week for the major clubs. So, we're going to have some fun again. And Heels is going to, again, show us how the Sci Sports business works. But we're going to look at some of the transfers that happened. Uh, over the past month, and going to use the size sports index to tell you um, who was bad, who was good, and who to look out for. So, the summer spending by the big clubs um, in the five big leagues actually equates to almost the GDP of Montenegro. Uh, it was over six billion US dollars was spent last month by football clubs. Um, if that doesn't make you concerned for the way the world's going, I don't know what does. Uh, all that <laughs> billions. Billions of dollars wasted, maybe. Uh, but we're going to talk about transfers. So the two most expensive transfers, if you can get the next slide up, are these two chaps. So Antoine Griezmann and Jao Felix. Each of those chaps, they are worth 130 million US dollars, um, which is good for them, good for their clubs. Apart from these two, these were the most expensive. So Heels, who were the two players who were the best value, if we look at the next the next slide. So these two chaps, these are who Heels thinks were the best value signings. So why, obviously you're a bit biased there with Frankie Dion, um, but why, why were these two the best value? Well, I think it's uh, strange to say, to say that something is value if you pay 85 million euros for a person. Um, but still, if you take a look at Frankie Dion, he's, he played extremely well at Ajax last season where they overperformed in the Champions League. And almost 30% of all the times that Ajax came into the final third, it came directly from a pass of Frankie. And the guy is 20 years old, and he's one of the youngest players ever to be elected in the um, Champions League team of the, of the year. And not playing at a top league, uh, top club, and not um, being a winner of the Champions League. And Ismaila Sar, um, if you take a look at what he did for his team, Wolverhampton paid 30 million euros for him. Um, right now, just because he moved to the Premier League, we estimate his value at 70 million. Um, he's 20 years old, so probably rising to 80 to 90 million in the next year. Um, so that's a huge bargain. Also, the benefit that Premier League clubs have, if you just buy a player, it will get worth more. Um, and he's an incredibly uh, versatile winger. So if you want to see a player that you really go to for the stadium, Ismaili Sarr is your man. Okay, and hands up anyone who sports Manchester United. So he was his, unfortunately going to disappoint Sorry, guys. you. The uh, worst value signing was <laughs> Harry Maguire. Why, why was he poor value? Um, basically, um, if you take English players, you pay an English tax. For Brazilian players, you pay a Brazilian tax. Um, so for um, poor English players, you pay more than for a really good Mexican player. Um, Harry Maguire just moved to for, I think, 70, 85 yeah. million? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we um, estimated this value at 50 million. So they were pay overpaying 45 million just to have an English player in their team. Uh, so maybe he will perform good, but there are way better players for that amount of uh, money. Okay, sorry to disappoint you, Man United supporters. So, um, in the copy of today's session, we were saying how AI is going to find the next Leo Messi. So here he is, greatest footballer in the world at the moment. Um, why, is, why is he so good, according to your business and your stats and analytics? Yeah, we did a research together with the University of Leuven. Um, and together we um, wanted to quantify who's the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And the article was about, is it Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo? And if you take a look at the, the individual stats of Messi, there's just no one near him. And there will be no one like him, I think, in the next 50 years. Probably said that about other players as well. But playing constantly uh, and consistently at that level, um, being responsible for over 50 goals every season, and making sure that your teammates become better, um, he has the full package. And I don't think there's a... Um, a player like him, but there might be some players that become as good as him. Yeah, and next slide. So here's who Heels thinks, based on the Sci Sports data in a few years' time, could be as good as Leonardo, uh, Leo Messi. So tell us about this chap, Anthony. Yeah, you can see his stats are not really good at this moment, um, but he's only playing um, the first three months in the Brazilian competition. He's playing for Sao Paulo. 
Um, if you see this guy's guy playing, he shows the same way of moving. He has fast feet, um, he's agile, he knows how to work around, and he's the fastest growing player um, over the last six months. Even though he's just a, a youngster, he's not 20 yet, um, but the, the style of playing, the involvement in the goals, um, the way he's able to move around the pitch and find his teammates, um, he could be one of the guys that could become the next Messi. Obviously, at a, a Bloomberg event, we, we talk about investments. Um, if we could get that slide back up. So the alternative investments we talk about, we talk about wine, we talk about cars. Um, there's actually um, a way in Brazil that you can be, set up a company and, and basically buy the registration of young Brazilian footballers. And we were talking about this, that um, there's not many investments in the world that are almost guaranteed to increase 50% per year. So maybe uh, some of you can club together set up a company, and you can start buying uh, Brazilian teenage footballers. And I think that might be a better way to go than buying wine <laughs> or cars, maybe. Now, let's, um, let's get some Bloomberg star questions in uh, while, while we're talking about uh, investments. So here was actually uh, the EU said you were going to be one of the next European unicorns. That was back in 2016. Obviously, you've been, uh, been acquired since then. Is that that's, that's correct? So. How's, how's, it, how's the business going? You, how's the growth going? Would, would you be a unicorn if you were still um, independent? How's, how's that going? Yeah, actually, we are still independent. Um, but I, don't, uh, I think the unicorn story is a couple of years away. Um, but I th we've seen a 50% growth over the past uh, six months. Um, at the beginning, two years ago, we just launched the, the, the program uh, 18 months ago. And I think... Since then, the amount of transfers that we are involved in um, grew from 5 to 25 to 100 um, to uh, almost 1,500 transfers where we were involved in this, uh, this year. So, so how, how much are you worth at the moment, would you say? We'll talk about it later. <laughs> what about an IPO? Not yet. Not no. yet. OK, there you go. Um, talk about the trade war, talking about Brexit um, very quickly. Has, has Brexit impacted your business? Will it impact your business? Um, well, I think one of the first questions that English people asked the government when Brexit came across, they said, what will happen to football? Um, so I think uh, if you, uh, I think the, uh, the Romans already said it, um, give the, uh, the people uh, bread and the games and they will uh, be happy. So I think Premier League will remain the same and our business there will, uh, will become and uh, grow steadily there. Good. Then we, uh, again, we mentioned the trade war about US versus, uh, versus China. Um, is that impacting your business at all? Is that impacting world football at all? I don't think it impacts uh, football because football is still pretty Europe-centered and the entire globe watches it. I think uh, with the World Cup final, there were over 2 billion people live watching the match. Um, but America and China, China increased the taxes on foreign players. Um, yeah, that was interesting. We meant, so if, if you follow football, maybe about three or two years ago, the Chinese, Chinese Super League, the Chinese uh, clubs started buying Western-based players for huge amounts of money, and that's very, very quickly died down. Why, why did that happen? Uh, they uh, decided to put a tax on when you buy a player for 100 million, you had to pay a tax to the Chinese government as also 100 million. So 100% tax on buying foreign players, because they wanted to stimulate the homegrown development of their players. I think they're investing two billion a year in youth, academy, uh, youth academies for football players. So they wanted to become, I think they want to win the World Cup in 2026. Um, so therefore they need to have their own space for the players. So you can buy foreign players, but it's pretty expensive. 